Having said all that, we're a few minutes late getting started. Uh, so I want to thank everybody so much for taking the time to join us today for this conversation. Uh, we're going to be talking about the, the kind of growing and changing world of opportunities for emerging and aspiring artists to earn a living from their art. So my name is John. I'm uh, your host tonight. I want to encourage everybody to uh, turn on your camera if you if you can, if you like, uh, to use the gallery view so you can see see everybody here, see everybody speaking. Uh, I think everybody's uh, already on mute right now, so so that's great. Stay on mute unless you need to uh, to get off to interrupt me or to ask a questions a question. Um, on that note, please feel free to ask any questions. Uh, if you want to put a question in the chat, amazing. If you want to raise a hand, uh, like I said, if if we're missing you, don't be afraid to unmute and, and interrupt us. Uh, it, this is meant to be kind of a casual, low pressure, uh, just interesting conversation between everybody here. So on that note, I want to jump in and start out by welcoming and introducing our panelists. Uh, I'm going to go kind of in uh, in reverse order of who showed up today. Uh, Patrick, Patrick Hunter. A little bit of bio on Patrick. Patrick is a two-spirit Ojibwe painter, graphic designer, and entrepreneur from Red Lake, Ontario. In 2011, so about 10 years ago, he made the move to Toronto to pursue a career in visual arts after completing the design program at Sioux College in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. After spending too long working in the service industry, it became clear that a major career move would need to be made. Knowing that his cultural background was an asset to his success, in 2014, he launched Patrick Hunter Art and Design. The focus is on specializing in original and digital artwork and designs from, from his Ojibwe roots with the intent to create a broader awareness of Indigenous culture and iconography. Welcome, Patrick. Where are you calling us from? You mentioned it's a cottage. Where are you? I'm actually back in Sault Ste. Marie. Oh, okay. Amazing. Um, around Lake Superior. And there's a lot of kids here, so I'm sorry for all the screaming. <laughs> no, no worries. No worries at all. All right. Welcome, Patrick. Uh, thanks for joining us. Then we have uh, Dauda. Uh, Dauda is a Toronto-based artist who's been honing his skills in mixed media and digital art for the past several years. Uh, originally a fine artist turned fashion photographer, Dauda blends his West African and Jamaican roots with 25 years of design experience, bringing about a perfect mar marriage of his two passions. He uses tribal figures, old shapes, and design to challenge the boundaries of people and culture and how they coexist, using color to tell canvas stories which explore the depths of relationships and composition. Welcome, Dauda. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, and then we have Tony Lay, with a background in creative arts, having studied fine art and art history in his youth. Tony emerged into the advertising and design industry with a fresh take on merging technology and creative. He co-founded Digital Messiah, his first digital agency in 1996, building brands and websites for companies ready to enter the new era. In 1999, Tony founded a new startup and turned his sights to helping the fashion and talent industry enter the internet age. In 2021, Tony's once again looking ahead to the future by helping creatives navigate the NFT and blockchain space. Welcome, Tony. Uh, Tony is also uh, a photographer and uh, is, is that bio, I think, understates his, uh, his creative work a little bit. <laughs> so, uh, so I just wanted to mention that. All right. Before we get into things, actually, well, let me introduce myself maybe a little bit. Uh, so my name is John Bowman, and I'm an executive career transition and personal development coach. And uh, in my work, I really try to help a lot of people who are looking to start new careers and new businesses, uh, and not just in art. And for really a lot of those people, 
the big challenge in creating a new business isn't only in identifying opportunities uh, to make money, but in figuring out which ones are worth really investing their time and effort into. And that's sort of what brought me to this. You know, I love art. You can you can see it in my background. Like this is not stage. This is this is really art that that uh, I love. And I'm really fortunate enough to have these these talented and uh, you know, talented artists and entrepreneurs in my network. And really happy to have them and uh, to have everybody here tonight. So before we get into questions, I want to put out a quick poll even though it's an intimate group i want to ask uh here's a quick poll so what role does art play for you professionally and so i want to just want to get an idea of who's here and then what is really bringing them to uh to the conversation today so for a small group yes okay here we got seven people Oh, everybody. Okay, amazing. Uh, let's end and share the results. So we have a couple full-time artists, a couple people who are part-time doing things as a side hustle, and a couple amateur or uh, aspiring artists. I it wouldn't let me choose, but I'm I'm in that kind of like hobby uh, amateur. I do a little bit of uh, kind of graphic design uh, myself only when I'm. I'm inspired or uh, or somebody has a, a project for me, but definitely not to the same degree as uh, as the other attendees here. So, all right, let's get into this conversation. Uh, we're here to talk about different opportunities for artists to earn an income. Uh, let me start, uh, Patrick, I will start with you. Um, can you give us an idea of the different types of avenues that you've pursued to uh, to turn your art into uh, a full time profession. So, um, <laughs> hello everyone. Um, I, it, it, I mean, it didn't all happen right away. Um, I just kind of got smarter as I kept continuing on with uh, my job, and uh, it was. I mean, joining a chamber of commerce um, was a big game changer for myself. Um, and I honestly didn't even know what one was until like maybe three years into it, just paying fees and like, what the fuck do these people do? And uh, once I once I figured out what it was, um, oh, okay. So, it, you know, it's, it's a great network to have. Um, and, you know, I, I definitely, didn't get started realizing that my, you know, as a gay person, but then also as a First Nations person as well, was an asset to this job that I was going to have, but kind of really leaning into who I am as a person uh, and, you know, culturally as well. Um, that's when things really kind of turned, turned around and um, it just got easier. You know, people vibe with the other people that are, um, authentic and, and genuine so i i was like you know what would happen if i was just honest with people about you know my my background and stuff and, and it, it sort of happened from there um i think also too like <clears throat> when you jump out of a career and just sort of like just you know, you're all in on something. That's when opportunities really kind of happen, or, or at least you're you're desperate enough to to take anything that come kind of come your, comes your way. So, uh, oh my God, am I on mute? No, I'm not. Um, <laughs> anyway, so you know, it's it sort of starts with that, but is that the same sort of formula for everyone? Maybe not so much, but um, I, it doesn't hurt to kind of fall back on you know, who are you, who you are and, and really try and market that up. And as much as the artwork is pretty good in my opinion, but um, it's, it, you know, the person behind it too, I think it, it helps to sell things. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That, that's, that's great. And um, really a big part of what I'm, I'm hearing out of that is that part of the, what kind of led you towards your success is, is really understanding, um, 
and embracing your identity and, and being authentic about that. Um, Mike Bordauda, I know that your art does really reflect uh, a lot of your, your background. Can you speak a little bit to your experience in, um, in, in finding or kind of communicating that? Um, well, I guess much like uh, with Patrick, it was more of an, a situation of just literally finding my voice and then feeling comfortable and sharing that. Um, very quickly, like when I was um, growing up, I was always, uh, uh, it's, it's like with uh, newcomers, in the house, everything's really cultural, but out of the house, you want to blend. It's all about assimilation and that. So friends would come over and I'd race through the house, take down all these artifacts, take down these tribal figures, like, you know, post out everything, beg my father to take off to the shiki, you know, all that kind of stuff. And then we'd have, uh, and then I'd allow my friends to come over. And so it's kind of interesting now that my art is all about me really tapping into those memories and tapping into my culture and where I came from. And so the, the biggest center of my uh, pieces are my tribal figures, my African people. And uh, what's interesting about it is it's not just African people, it's myself being depicted in those situations. So it's more like, I guess, an allegory or like a day in the life of me. And then, but I've done it in these tribal designs or these tribal colors, very earth colors, um, very bold, um, with such a large sense of pride. And I just stuck to it, um, almost unapologetic. Um, mm. And I did find my tribe, meaning individuals that supported my efforts. And that made it a lot easier. Through that, I found strength. So it's almost like an after school special. <laughs> Build it, they will come. Believe yourself, that will happen. <laughs> yeah. So that's that's my story. Yeah, amazing. Um, Tony, your you know your history really seems like it's a a little bit more leaning towards uh, the technology. But do you feel like the work that you're doing uh, reflects your personality and your experience? Um, yeah, I think, you know, like my, my experience, um, like the work that I do, um, you know, tries to blend, you know, uh, tries to blend technology in with uh, creativity, because I do have a creative side to me. And um, it, for a while, I really, really tried to kind of separate the two. Um, but understanding that, um, that my ability um, uh, in in technology to learn technology um, is an asset to my creativity. So it kind of works hand in hand. Mm. And I think that's, you know, really important. Uh, like everybody else, it's, um, you know, finding who you are and, and, and embracing that and not shying away from it um, just because social constructs may push you in a way that, uh, you know, that, uh, that might deviate from who you are. Mm. Yeah, um, I like how what you're saying is is that for a while it's almost as if you were trying to separate some of these these strengths, um, some of these things you're really good at with this technology from the creative side of yourself. But uh, but I seem to have kind of found some success when you embraced both of them. Is that does that um, yeah. resonate? Yeah, no, absolutely. That resonates because, um, you know, when I kind of early in my career, when I started shying away from technology and I said, oh, well, well, I don't want to do that. Uh, and I want to be a full time creative and, and, and be an art director and, and all these things, all these great things. Um, then uh, I found myself uh, uh, being categorized um, very similar, like be categorized the same way as other creatives and you're you're put kind of like you know side by side against them but as soon as I have this as soon as I presented myself as having this understanding of technology in a deep way um, and being creative then I could talk to both sides of a business and both sides of an agency 
um, where, especially back when um, you know I started uh, started my first agency, it was you know um, it was very separate. People like creatives didn't understand technology, they didn't understand programming, and uh, you know and and programmers didn't understand creativity, <laughs> and they said, "Can't you just fit it in this box?" And yeah. Then, so kind of bridging those two, you know, enabled me again to 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 separate myself and to help people kind of bridge that gap. Yeah, yeah, that's great. That's great. Um, I'm gonna like change gears a little bit in in um, kind of the questions uh, because when sort of when I I was pitching this uh, this panel. Part of what I, uh, I I was wondering and, and wanted to, to maybe tap into the experience is the like practically speaking like what are the options for an artist uh, you know, for like a visual artist what kinds of things can they do to earn income with that art uh, and you know I'll, I'll go back. To Patrick, because I'm, I'm familiar with with some of your work, but for example, you, you know, I've seen you had your art on mugs and T-shirts, and um, you know you, you've done digital work, and you've kind of been all over the, the place. Um, can you maybe give us an idea, of, like what are all the kinds of things <laughs> that you have tried? It started out <clears throat> primarily just with um, with paintings and like I don't know if you've ever been to Gabby's on King West, but it's a dump. And after <laughs> showing up there and getting burned alive by fryer grease every day, uh, I was like, "There's got I didn't move here to to do that." So um, once I mean, and I'd always painted, so I just kind of again like leaned back on on what I was good at and let people pay bi-weekly or monthly for their I took on like a bunch like four or five originals at once and you know not everyone has the cash to do that either so made prints figured out how to do that what size what's you know what worked with like frames so it would be easier on people to to get things framed um i wish someone told me earlier to do mugs because i've sold thousands and so if there's anyone in the room here today that that is interested in kind of becoming an entrepreneur or just put your stuff on mugs you know <laughs> they'll sell <laughs> like people it, the, the price points right and you know it makes a good gift people love coffee and tea um and then i it kind of evolved from there to like oh like instead of making artwork to put on people's walls like let's keep, see people in the artwork so like i made t-shirts and you know that's that's how it's got going and it's it's a different feeling when um someone comes up to you in the street that you've never met before and they're wearing your stuff but then they you know, at the same time are like i feel so confident in this this like makes me feel buff or strong or you know whatever the word is um that feels different than someone like you know just buying a piece for their wall or whatever like when it makes them feel a certain way I've just been chasing that and mm -hmm. and then also uh once you can kind of figure out how to teach it and and show people how to how to do artwork um it it just becomes a, a lot easier to do because like in, in the beginning I didn't really know what my like, my process was for designing. I just would do it. And then when you have to actually like show people the steps that it, it's really, um, it resonates and it makes it easier because now you know mm. the steps. <laughs> I mean, um, since then it's uh, last point I'll, I'll kind of throw out there is like, it's kind of like this shit that I like resonates with people. Like I like paddling. So I made paddles. Um, <laughs> Amazing. I like eating off of wood, so I made cutting boards. So once once you can kind of like show people what you really are into, then I think it, it sort of resonates with them as well. Great, great, thank you. Um, Michael, what has your uh, experience been and 
your experience or, or what are your your feelings about uh, you know for example using using your art on different products like this um well first off i i struggled with it uh, i won't lie i really did struggle with it um not so much because you know it was distilling or diluting a message it wasn't anything like that it was more about um the accessibility of it all because my work is more it's more art therapy i don't know how else to say it and i literally had to get when i first started like this is my third or fourth attempt back into the art world so uh, but the first time when i was like crazy successful at it because i was some new kid um i struggled with it because it was really art therapy for me and i was working through a lot of issues and so to have my work out there was uh, you know, I literally had to be talked off the ledge for art shows. I had to be talked off the ledge for prints. I had to be talked off the ledge. And then um, the second time around, well, so let's skip to now. I, um, I realized that I need to do art and to um, just for my own mental health and my own well being and to share that. So now I, there's certain items or certain pictures or certain creations that I feel comfortable with and it's no longer um, almost like an ego thing like no longer like there's that separation and I'm okay with it even though I know that um, a lot of people my pictures are just a picture and they don't know the emotional journey that attached to it or they don't particularly care or it has no place because it's evoking another emotional journey for them so how yeah. I decide it's more like a um, it's what I feel good with, like what I feel separated from. Mm. Yeah. Does yeah. that make sense? Like, yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like that picture is about a breakup. And the idea of seeing that breakup on a t-shirt and on a mug and on hives is like, great, when will the healing begin? But no, <laughs> no, that's about it. Yeah. No, it's um, you make you make some great points. Uh, I'll, you know, throw it maybe back to, to Tony again. Tony, you've had you've had experience, you know, as a creative and, and as a, as somebody with with an agency. Um, do you have any any thoughts or feelings about that uh, that distinction or that choice of having your your art or your creative work used in a in a highly exclusive way, like a one off? you know, one copy versus being used uh, in, a, in a mass market kind of way. I think it just goes back to the individual artist and how they want, how they see themselves um, as an artist, but also earning, earning a living. I think there's, there's definitely uh, merit to, to all, you know, to lots of different ways to earn a living as an artist, whether you're, you're making one off, um, illustrations or uh, visual art pieces uh, and selling them galleries, selling them, uh, you know, through gallerists and, and through collectors, or even uh, going as far as, uh, you know, making prints, you know, having a limited run print, or uh, even going down the road of, um, of merchandising and, um, you know, and this new um, kind of, uh, th this new era of, digital art uh, in, mm. in its current form as NFTs and how that kind of tran translates into kind of uh, people's earnings. I think what we have to look at is, um, is the community behind it, right? The community um, kind of behind each of these, uh, you know, areas where you sell your art um, is, uh, is, is very important to, uh, you know, to, uh, to understand, to be able to sell your art. Um, if it's purely an artistic endeavor and you don't necessarily need to or want to make money off your art, and, uh, you know, that's fine and good. Um, but if you're looking at, you know, in, in my perspective, if you're looking at uh, monetizing your art or making a living through your art, you really have to kind of almost treat it like a business, right? Um, and, yeah, coming from, 
you know, the uh, agency side and more of the business side of, com of like being a commercial artist and a, a commercial designer and all those things. Um, you know, you look at viable products, you look at like what is going to, what your audience is going to enjoy out of the product that you're selling. It's not necessarily just about, um, yeah, let's make a bunch of prints and sell them to, to my fans, my collectors, my audience. Um, but what, you know, how do they interact with it? How do they appreciate and giving them ideas of how to utilize that, uh, I think is important yeah. as well, inspiring them too, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, you mentioned like so many things that I <laughs> want to ask more questions about. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna start and, and I don't know if you can do this, but the, the conversation of NFTs has come up. There's been some you know, sales of NFTs for millions of dollars. Um, and I know that I'm, you know, I'm even a little bit unclear on what it is. Is it possible for you to give us like the most simple, dumbed <laughs> down um, explanation of what an NFT is in the context of art? Um, yeah, so basically the, I guess the simplest way to look at it is that it's a, it's a contract. It's a contract for your art. Um, represent it, it is digital. It is a contract. It points to your art. It's a, you know, essentially it's just a bunch of code that points to your art and gives you uh, functionality to your art. Um, and that's kind of it. Like if you're, for example, if you're a visual artist and you, uh, and you sell your art in terms of licenses for like stock, stock illustration, uh -huh. that kind of stuff. You have a contract from, you know, whether, you know, whichever stock, um, stock company you're hosting it on, and they will hold to that. They will hold you to that. They will hold themselves to that and their clients to that contract. Payout is X amount of dollars, you know, and, and how the usage is and that kind of stuff. So it's essentially a contract for your digital art uh, to be able to make it, uh, you know, yours, unique, rare, mm -hmm. Um, and valuable uh, in a digital space because as you know as everybody knows that you know holding value on a digital item is uh, near impossible when you have the ability to copy all of this base in, in a simplicity uh, code for your yeah. illustration and and share it amongst everybody yeah so yeah so uh, i think the, sim the simplest way you know is that it's a contract for your digital art and it's uh, it's it, it's it's um, uh, impenetrable almost, right? Okay, okay. Um, so it almost this this kind of part of what I'm I'm taking away from that, or, or like a small part of it is, um, and this is because I was kind of looking into this before. Is is it somewhat like a a certificate of authenticity uh, yes yeah, so exactly like it is is it is like a certificate of authenticity but it can because it's because it's code it can have it can hold function right yeah that's why i lean more into kind of a contract yeah right? because you know your licensing fees can be written directly into that contract um mm. or into that nft great example is um, you know, if you mint NF, if you mint an NFT on a specific um, platform, they will give you, you know, ten percent of all of the sales that happens in existence of your NFT. So any okay. any anybody who collects your work, if they sell it in a resale market, whether it's Christie's or whether it's you know somewhere else on a different market, you will you will earn ten percent every time it sells and it's wow. built okay to this program so you don't yeah. have to wait for kind of like the yeah. the marketplace to say oh here's your check or your manager here's your check right yeah. it's automatic it automatically gets deducted and put into your wallet interesting wow okay okay yeah um 
that that made it definitely a little bit clearer for me. I, I'm not sure it did um, for everyone else. Um, in that 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 line of, of discussion, uh, kind of put it out there openly to to Dad or to Patrick. Have either of you uh, done any licensing of uh, of digital versions of your work? Yeah, I think that was kind of it's become like the bread and butter of my business, and it's it's pretty arbitrary. Uh, like I'm like I guess this is the price that I'm gonna charge you and they're like okay and you know it's it's bananas it's like oh here's a digital version of of something I, I made a long time ago and I'm still able to kind of gain money from it so mm -hmm. there's like a, a, a website called Carfax I think Carfax I can't remember anyway but um it kind of gives you the price listing of, of like what things cost so i didn't know this until i got paid this but it was like if you in a magazine for instance they'll pay you 350 bucks for something that's in it and then if it's on the cover it's 750 so or 650 or something like that okay. so it's just kind of once i was once i learned that i was like okay this is the standard so once yeah. you kind of start to do it um at least for me and, and what i'm doing with, with my artwork um it's just sort of like an easy way to make money and you're like what but <laughs> you know you got to do it and people are thirsty for digital images these days so it it's it's good but it's also sort of strange to charge people for something that you know doesn't have a physical form mm, interesting um how did those opportunities come your way I mean, it's like I have this magical career a little bit. Um, <laughs> just I go through my spam folder and my email and things end up in there. But um, again, it was kind of joining a chamber of commerce that really kind of changed things up for me. Um, and I didn't know what I was doing there either. I just was like, OK, I'll join. And, you know, it was um, companies that were interested in in the work that kind of were like do you have this digitally that we can put this onto mm -hmm. mugs and we can co-brand and it that's how you kind of got ideas to to work with things but i think for sure um joining a chamber of commerce is uh, i'm probably being annoying and how many times i've said chamber of commerce but <laughs> they work like it's so bananas just do it yeah uh, cglcc uh, Canadian Gay Lesbian Chamber of Commerce, that's a good one to join. Um, you know, there's all kinds. And mm -hmm. um, a lot of corporations are looking for diverse spends because they've, you know, historically just chose the same ones over and over again. So um, do that. Okay. Um, before I, I give you a break, you mentioned that you had joined the Chamber of Commerce and you were there for a couple of years before it started to yield anything. Um, what what did you have to do to make that membership uh, like valuable or fruitful for your, yourself? Um, that's a good question. I I think it took working with one corporation, and then mm -hmm. and then I sort of just got more comfortable with it and more able to speak the language that you speak when you work with larger um bigger businesses or even medium businesses like i just i didn't know what seo meant i didn't know any business lingo and then once you kind of start to hang around with these people it rubs off and um in you know, canada luckily is not a very big place so you start to know someone that works at walmart they know someone that works at staples and it, it kind of comes a smaller it's a smaller community yeah. once you kind of start to know people but it you know you gotta here's the best way i can ever explain it is like it's your ticket to the dance if you want to dance with someone then you know you'll you'll talk to them but if, if you want to hang out in the corner that's kind of how it works um and luckily i'm not a good dancer but i like to do it 
<laughs> um, amazing, uh, amazing analogy. Uh, what I, what I'm hearing is that uh, you know I don't think this necessarily is is exclusive to chambers of commerce, but that that that, that networking is um, really critical in making contacts and, and building that that awareness of your work and um, and kind of yeah just putting you on on people's radar for sure and one thing i did um i i always donate stuff to like you know um what is it called like a registration booth or whatever like you know here's a door prize and uh, there's a lot of people out there that don't that can't recognize an opportunity for an opportunity they're like if i'm not getting paid i'm not doing it and I realized early on that if, you know, more people are going to know about your stuff if, if sometimes you give it out for free, but, mm -hmm. um, and that's how I've gotten some opportunities just like, oh, I won your painting at a, at an event and I would really love to work with you. Okay. And now I've branded orange shirt day for Rogers. Like wow. it kind of happens through sometimes giving things up for free, but yeah, it's worked out in the end. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, it's it's also interesting that the conversation is kind of, you know, there's there's, you know, what are you gonna make for art? There's, you know, how, where are you gonna sell it? And then how are you going to make people aware? Like how are you gonna get people to your store? Like, you know, so I feel like there's some several elements to that. Um, Michael, you you've had kind of several different incarnations of, of your, your career as, um, as an artist and, and a photographer. What role do you think that that, that, that networking, that that getting out there uh, played in the successes you had? It was all of it, all of the success. <laughs> um, like, um, they, when I was a fashion photographer, it was all about, like there was very few um, uh, black fashion photographers, for example. So you stood out. So whether you were good or you were bad, you stood out. And uh, but everybody wanted to give you a chance um, because they wanted to know for themselves. Mm. And uh, so it was great. Uh, I, I went to the. There was a lot of networking, and not just the parties and that, but the actual committees uh, going on. And much uh, and volunteering your work, volunteering your time, doing a lot of testings, like just getting out there, and you, you sort of build. And same thing with uh, when I transitioned more or back into art, it was pretty much the same thing. Like you know, it was uh, very much um, a cultural experience. Uh, they wanted to know more of the story and it was all about networking and much like with anything you want to it doesn't matter what you do it really doesn't matter what your style of art is or what your type of photography is or what your type of anything is people want to know that they can work with you that you're personable that you are you can express yourself you're not going to give them problems you're not going to be a diva um you're going to be professional so and then once that's established, then everything else is just everything else. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah, that, that's great. Um, Tony, as as our calls, sort of uh, technological expert and and futurist, <laughs> um, how do you think, kind of like all of our our new technologies, new medias, you know, social media how do you think that has evolved that that networking side um, of building a career in creative art yeah no it actually you know definitely has evolved that it gave a lot gave everybody the ability to reach communities like it, mm. you know it, if you want to be successful as an artist has a professional anything like you need to join that community whether it is the chamber of commerce or whether it is you know your community group right um and the internet and the technology has given that it's given you know uh, given the ability to refine um your search for your community for the people that uh, will love your work will collect your work and will support you and will, will want to work with you um right now uh, in the NFT space, uh, it's 
hugely uh, driven by community. So getting in to an NFT community is, is very important because um, the, the leverage that they have and the passion that they have for NFT artists and for artists wanting to be in the NFT space is great. Um, it, it goes as far as they you join the community and they will buy your work. Um, because they want to support you, yeah, and 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 that and that's a powerful thing, um, and and it's a new market and that uh, you know technology has birthed this you know uh, this new market uh, of NF you know in the NFT art space um, with uh, you know new new people that are new to collecting art, um, mm. and I think that's important too because you're not looking at the same. Uh, old guard as in the you know, people that collect from Christie's and from Sotheby's and, and that kind of stuff. You're looking at people that, um, you know, that, that are new to the art scene. Um, they have come into money because of new technology, because of blockchain, and they want uh, to um, kind of buy and support other people with the technology. And they want to support the technology as well. So they will buy, you know, you know, I've seen, you know, I've seen, or I'm sorry, I've uh, been in discussions uh, in these communities where um, fellow artists are saying, yeah, you know what, you know, when your work uh, is released, I'll, I'll pay $5,000 for it, no problem, right? Yeah. So it's very exciting. Um, uh, and, and the reach that everyone gets uh, is, 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 is great. Um, I can't see anything really too bad about like, what technology has done for artists, as long as you're able to kind of navigate that. Mm -hmm. I think that's that's the scariest part. Um, you know, my discussion, my you know, calls and discussions with other artists trying to get into like, you know, whether it's the NFT space or even previously with uh, companies trying to get into technology space, is that they just don't know where to start, and that can be daunting. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think. Uh, you know, if you can take it on, kind of, you know, grab it, grab it by its horns and, 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 and learn as much as you can about it and be part of a community. Um, yeah. That, that's important. Um, so where, where would you point somebody to start? Like, where, where would you send them? Uh, you know, if you had a specific place to send them for, uh, to get them started to learn about it. Where would that be? Um, I would probably like. I would probably say um, the first place is just to Google <laughs> NFT, like <laughs> NFT art, and see where see what um, kind of educate yourself through Google um, of what kind of art is out there, what kind of artists are out there. Um, because you know, earlier this year we saw um, and and the NFT artist people. You know, mm -hmm. uh, one of the more popular uh, artists, and he, uh, you know, bridged the uh, NFT art world with the traditional uh, collecting art world, uh, selling his collection um, on Christie's for $69 million. <laughs> oh, just pure digital, just a yeah. digital, digital art. That's yeah. it, just, just pixels, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and so, yeah, if you can, you know, like Google NFT art, look at who are the players look at you know um, read up on the technology because that is very important understanding the technology and what it can do mm -hmm. um, or and then on top of that um, join a community i think you know i'm part of a community in on um, uh, on clubhouse um, if anybody's heard of clubhouse yeah. and there's an nft community on clubhouse and they uh, are constantly talking about where nfts are NFTs are going. They are looking to talk with other NFT artists, uh, and they're looking to help people kind of onboard into the space. Um, from, yeah. the, from from the first drops to uh, to uh, educating them on kind of like you know what is it going to take because it is a community. Yeah. What, yeah. You know, you can't just you know a lot of people in in kind of like when NFTs what came became popular in the news. You got a lot of people just making art and, you know, one-offs and that was their only piece and yeah. they weren't selling and they were just kind of confused. Yeah. Uh, yeah. For the most part, people only want to buy art from artists that 
we'll continue to work. We'll continue to have art to show for, right? Um, and building that body, I think is yeah. important. Yeah, and you know, like being part of a community, like that community will support you in your endeavors if you go down the road of NFT. And, Amazing. Uh, in, and, and they're great. They're super yeah. supportive people. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's really interesting to hear this idea of community and finding, uh, finding people, you know, like finding that community, finding that peer group and, and getting their support and, and leaning on their experience and their guidance to help bring you up uh, as an artist is a really amazing kind of idea and not something I expected to hear at all in <laughs> talking about this. Uh, but the other thing that I heard was that that idea, I'm going to say it this way, but maybe have to explain myself that, that as an artist, you will find huge supporters, your huge, your fans, those people that are just so excited for your success and who will, you know, be buying your art and, and, you know, doing everything they can to, to share um, what's going on with you. And I've seen that with with other artists, you know, and and I mean, even outside of art, you find those those cheerleaders, those fans, those people that are just like so excited about what you're doing. Uh, but it's also really interesting to hear that like moving into the NFT space that you're gaining new art fans who aren't just fans of the artist, but who are, are fans of the technology. So it's like, it's a whole new uh, world of, of, you know, support and there is a sort of like buyers, and <laughs> whole new markets uh, of people. So, uh, so that's, that's really, really interesting to hear. Um, okay. I, I'm, Watching the time, I don't want to go over too much, so I'm going to ask a few, uh, or maybe even a couple, easy questions. All right. For each of you panelists, what title do you prefer? Do you prefer to be called an artist, a designer, a creator, a creative? Uh, which one of those really speaks to you? I see Dowda looks like he wants to speak up. Yeah, <laughs> let's get on with this. Um, because I, I like to kick it old school, and I'm an artist, uh, pure and simple. Uh, I fashion myself being like you know taking my art to another level, like and and, and being doing more designs and more creative type, mm -hmm. or implementing like homeware and and more wearable art. But at the end of the day, I'm still an artist, and. Uh, yeah. Took me a long time to even admit that to myself. It's like, yeah, Ma, I'm an artist. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. Great, great, Patrick. What about you? I, I, I don't, have no idea. I think about that actually a, a couple times a month. I'm like, um, self-employed. <laughs> <laughs> <'Cause> I, I <laughs> almost threw out there like entrepreneur or you know. Yeah. You know, I'm. I guess I would go back to being an artist or whatever, but like, even when you uh, <clears throat> have to put in the job title, I'm like, I don't know, create like a creative director seems a little bit too fancy for me, but <laughs> I just sort of try to leave it, just stay self-employed. Okay. Yeah. So like, like no label right now. Yeah. Tony, what about you? Um. Yeah, that one is kind of a unknown for me. Um because i wear so many hats um you know it's 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 tough to kind of nail that like i i can say i'm a creative person or um but also can say you know like i'm you know uh technologist um thinking human yeah <laughs> <laughs> um, i don't know like to be honest like like um a creative thinking human there we go yeah okay great um one if you had to give like one piece of advice to somebody who is like really early in their in their artistic career 
just starting out, what's, what's the, the one piece of advice that you would give them? Uh, Tony, back to you. Um, my one biggest piece of advice would be to show your work often and show your process. Mm. Through that, you're going to gain your audience and your fans. And there's no better way to uh, kind of engage with people through the process of your art, through your growth, because I think that's what people kind of um, want from being a fan of anybody, right? whether it's an artist or an athlete. Um, it's, it's about that connection, that personal connection that the individual has with the artist. And I, that, that's why all of these, um, you know, uh, big collectors, they love listening to artists and they love reciting what the artist told them when they bought the work, right? Um, it's about that connection. So I think, yeah, if you're a new artist and you're going to, uh, and, and you want to, you know, boots to the ground, share your work, share your thoughts, share your process with the world and the world will come to you. Wow. Amazing. Wow. I love it. I love it. All right, Patrick, I think you've given a couple, but what's your, what's your one? My, my most, I wish I knew this sooner, but get a fucking accountant and don't be, <laughs> don't be afraid to spend money on hiring people. If you can't do it, hire someone else to do it. And I wish I just kind of, felt better about that sooner on, but yeah, that would be a good place to start. Oh, okay. Real entrepreneurship advice. Yeah. <laughs> now to... um, I'd have to say it's almost um, like where Tony was going, but more about know yourself. Like truly know who you are, your product, and where you're at at that time, because we're constantly evolving. But I, I think it's hard to really sell yourself, sell your process, do this or present your this or present that if you don't actually know what you're doing or you don't know exactly yeah. who you are and what do you want to con convey and what part of you do you want to convey? Um, yeah. A little bit is a lot, is it whatever? So, yeah, I think that that, and I kind of wish I knew that more because uh, like I was just making things up as I was going along and people were eating it up, but then, I was often caught with the hard question of, so what's your process? Or who are you? Or where are you coming from? And it's like, yeah. I'm not here to share all that. So just knowing who you are and where you are on your journey. And then, you know, and there you have it. Amazing. Okay, before we say goodbye, um, where can people find you? Dada. Oh. Um, it's easy for me because it's just my last name dot com. Uh, and uh, that's the easiest. I kind of tore down all the other points of social media <laughs> and I'm rebuilding, rebranding. Yeah. Okay. Dot dot com. Okay. I'm going to throw that into the chat as well for people. Uh, Tony, where can people find you? Um, lots of places. <laughs> um, <laughs> where do you want where do you want them to go first um you can find me on my instagram at it's me tony lee or you can find me directly on, on my website tony lee.ca um, hey. and if you know if uh if not if you don't have any of those if you don't have instagram you can find me on linkedin as well like everybody else. Amazing, amazing. And Patrick put into the chat Instagram Patrick Hunter underscore art. Okay. Before I well, let first, I want to thank everybody so much. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Dada. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you to everybody who joined us. Still on the call. Tina, Matthew, uh, Aaron, and Craig. Thank you so much. Uh, my last question for everybody is. I'll even put it up in a bit of poll so you don't have to have to tell me is if we were to do or if I was to, to put another event like this with different different panelists or some of the same panelists, different topic, would you be interested in, in uh, joining us for that? 
Amazing. Wow. Okay. It's <laughs> unanimous. Okay. I love it. Again, thank you so much to everybody. Uh, I really appreciate it so much. It's been, for me, a really just unexpected conversation. It went in places that I really, you know, I hadn't anticipated. I think so much value. I, I hope you did too. Um, and then I, yeah, we'll say good night. Thank you again.